I'm good. Doing well. Good, good. Thanks for coming on today. Sure, thank sure. you. Morning, everybody. Hi, Shane. Morning, Tony. Hey, I'll call you back right now, ready? <laughs> <laughs> Phone tag, so. Yeah. Hi, Brett. Morning. Morning. Commissioner Kirshner, do we need a brief uh, executive session to discuss the legal issue that uh, Nikki sent over? Uh, yeah, I suppose we will at the end here. So let's uh, I'll do that after comments if we can. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I'm content to let you and Stacy make the decision, but uh... yeah, we'll have a discussion. Well, thank you. Okay, it's 10 o'clock. Uh, I will call this meeting of the Senate County Commissioners to order for Thursday, October 1st, 2020. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. To the flag of the United, United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Paradiso, I'm about putting this in a purple mood here. Dear God, we pray for your protection as one nation under God. We ask that you surround this country and cover us with your mighty hand. We pray for unity in our land that in spite of all our differences, we would be willing to stand strong together and live out our days with compassion and grace. Remind us to live aware and be willing to make a difference in this land. Give us courage to speak out. Help us not to stay silent, but to do all the things through your wisdom and love. We pray for your great healing of our land. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Nikki, roll call, please. Commissioner Kirshner? Here. Commissioner Paradiso? Here. Commissioner Thomas? I am here. So the first item on our agenda this morning, uh, and we are happy to welcome uh, Brent Howard and Reverend Aaron Gerlach to talk about a project that they've been working on at the Episcopal Church. Uh, so uh, I guess Aaron or Brent, would you like to start? Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Kirshner. I'll start. Um, um, as uh, you said, I'm Brent Howard. I'm a member of uh, the vestry at Old Trinity Episcopal Church, uh, located at 125 uh, East Market Street, uh, your neighbor on uh, Courthouse Square, uh, the Justice Center. And uh, we, uh, Aaron and I, come to you uh, here today to talk about a project, uh, a ministry that the church is working on that involves um, um, programming that is beneficial to the community and also uh, specifically for today's purposes and in addition to informing you about the project, we also want to talk to you about the use of a small portion of your um, property that you own on the Justice Center. 
Um, uh, the portion of the property is directly behind our church at 125 East Market Street. It is approximately a 25 by 55 foot um, area that is in your um, parking lot. Um, and um, we will talk more about the specifics of that area, but just to put in your mind, this is, we're talking about expanding the church um, to take approximately half of the, the parking spots in that uh, parking lot that serves the Justice Center. It would not uh, interfere with the entrance as it currently um, is situated and uh, would maintain um, six parking spots um, in that parking lot. Um, and, but we'll talk more about the details of the project in that particular area. So uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity um, for us to come before you to talk about the project and how it involves the county and the entire community. With that, um, I would um, introduce um, uh, the Reverend Aaron Gerlach, uh, the minister, the priest at Old Trinity Episcopal Church. He has a brief uh, PowerPoint presentation um, to give you details about uh, our project. Uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, like uh, Brent said, I'm Father Aaron Gerlach, the priest of Old Trinity Episcopal Church, and we're excited to talk Aaron. to you. Aaron, we lost you there a minute. The, the, the sound went down. So if you could, I don't know if you could turn the sound up or um, you began, you began very well and then it faded out. All right, let's see here. Um, audio settings automatically. Uh, yeah, we still can't hear you, Aaron. Okay. All right, let's see what I can do. I don't know. I can hear him. Can you hear me okay? No. Hmm. I don't know how to bring the volume up. Um, okay. Um, I got a different one. Okay. We, we want to. Uh, work on the technical difficulty a moment here. Uh, Jimmy, anything you can do out there? Uh, Commissioner Kirsten, I think it's it's on his end. Uh, I'd probably have to be there. It sounds like we can hear him. It's just not picking it up very loudly. So maybe if he could move closer to where the microphone is, it might be worth a try. Okay. And what Aaron will provide, he has, um, uh, I believe he has the opportunity to screen share um, with the commissioners to um, show the uh, PowerPoint uh, slides. All right, does this sound better? Yes, Perfect. you're fine. Yeah. There we go, okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen share then. All right, is this uh, showing up okay? It is. It is. All right. Yeah. So, uh, great. So, the first thing I want to share is a little bit of our process of how we got to the point of coming here today. Um, Old Trinity might be like a typical church, and often when we think about our building and the grounds we maintain, it's, it's you know, we start at a point of thinking about making sure the roof doesn't leak, the electricity turns on, and so forth. And being historical property, um, we have we find ourselves of course you know honored to be part of the courthouse square and as a vestry as leadership team in the church we started moving in a different direction in the, over the last couple of years uh in this um where we started this process of restoring these historical stained glass windows in the church uh the one you see on the screen is of the first mayor of tiffin we thought you know that started sparking our imagination about how we might be connected to the community in a different way and then uh, due to a bequest of uh, Reggie and Edith Pancoast uh, parishioners here, we were able to uh, renovate our garden level space, what we call the undercroft in the church to really think about, and that's the third photo here, about how we might make our space more a community space 
that we share with the community and use as a resource for the community. So we did this remodeling, um, making it feel more like a, a welcoming somebody into our home. And uh, the 12 step groups that meet down there, uh, particularly before COVID-19, uh, found this space to be particularly welcoming and, and felt like it helped them value the work that they were doing, that we were investing in, in them. And so that sparked our imaginations to start thinking about uh, the space that's behind this remodel space, the kitchen, which hadn't really been remodeled for several decades. And so we started asking ourselves if we are to invest in our kitchen to remodel it, to make it up to code for the um, county health department uh, for widespread use, uh, who might use that resource? And so we started talking with a, a wide variety of people around the community. And as we started talking about the community, we realized that, you know, this asset that we are um, uh, thinking about as a community resource really is located in the middle of a lot of investment in our community with the new national corner with the splash pad and the amphitheater that if we started, you know, opening up our imagination and thinking outside the box, we might be uniquely positioned to offer something to the community through this kitchen. And we also started thinking about the downtown in general, about how there are people imagining uh, investing in some really um, interesting ways in our community and, and the people who are starting to move and live downtown with um, places for rent that range from, I, I think I saw in the uh, uh, report, from 375 to around 1800 a month. And so we're getting a diverse group of people living downtown. So where that led us as a faith community is we started thinking about ourselves as, as envisioning how we can use our property to be welcoming spaces where people can connect around shared values and to build relationships that add value to Tiffin and Seneca County. So out of that conversation around the community kitchen project, which is what this is end up being, is it's, it's a community kitchen, not a soup kitchen for a church or a church kitchen that other people use, but truly a kitchen that is that the community has ownership over. And so it started becoming in our conversations as, as a way that Old Trinity could offer leadership uh, where we could help the community invest in the health and wellness of everyone in the community. And six key areas developed uh, in our conversations of how this space would be used almost immediately once it, w once it was built, if we're able to do so. Uh, the farmers market and the local producers uh, see a, a strong partnership with the farmers market. One of the uh, um, barriers to a more fuller and robust local um, food market is people sometimes don't know how to use the products that are grown on our local farms in their own uh, homes. And so we could use this community kitchen to offer an opportunity for people to buy things at the farmers market or from our local producers and then have some classes on how, on how they can use those in their own home. Or it could be a local chef who uh, buys things at the farmer's market in the morning and then has a pop-up restaurant at lunchtime to serve uh, a menu that is from locally sourced products. And so, and you could also think about expanding the growing season by helping people buy um, abundance of produce when it's in season and then helping them learn how to preserve and can it to doing some group um, sessions on that. Another option is partnering with health professionals. That was very exciting, exciting in uh, the conversations we had. Uh, an example of that could be, say, we bring together a couple of different households where a member is um, suffering from diabetes, has uh, diabetes, and then we could help those households learn how to cook uh, healthy and, and nutritious meals that are both diabetic friendly, but also things the whole family wants to eat. And you could build a network and, and community around these several families that are doing this together. At the same time, you know, you could have health professionals coming in to talk about other lifestyle choices that are available in our community for people with diabetes. Uh, you could also have, um, there might be resources, uh, not just education, but resources to help people say get insulin at a lower cost. Um, another exciting opportunity is people, uh, particularly in this, in, in this environment, are interested in um, making um, meal prep. So for example, you might have a group of, of working moms who want to come together on a Saturday morning to make a bunch of freezer-ready meals that they can uh, easily prepare with just a 
few quick steps at home throughout the week. And, and that uh, cooperative might have some of the moms shopping this week and others cooking this week and some who just can't even participate this week and they just come together on their own and rent the community kitchen space to do this work together. Or you could have a bunch of young professionals who want to bring uh, food to work to eat for lunch and they could come together and make those prepped meals to take to work. Another spot we found of interest in our community is there have been in the past several cooking classes that are well attended and people are lamenting that those are the space for that is not available in the same way it used to be in the past. So we would offer this space uh, for those cooking classes to happen, uh, anyone who would want to teach them and, and on a variety of um, cooking topics. Uh, a fifth place is um, like the performing arts, the culinary arts are having a diminished role in our public education system. And so local uh, public education uh, and, and vocational and um, people in the profession of culinary arts locally see this space functioning much the way the Ritz does, where it, has, it functions as a community theater, this would be a community kitchen that can promote culinary arts. So you could have, for example, an after school club of high schoolers who uh, come and learn to cook together, either because they're the primary um, food producer in their home or just because they have a passion and want to learn. And then maybe once a semester, they do a nice fine dining experience in that front half of our undercroft uh, for the households and friend, friend, family members they want to have come with them. Um, what the, the local professional culinary arts community likes about that is it helps them identify people who may have a passion for this as a career that they can then steer into the profession or people at uh, Vanguard and Sentinel who might steer them into their programming or a Tiffin University into their hospitality program. And then last, the last piece is some people are excited about how we can come together to do service in our community around food. So for example, we might be offering uh, a once a week healthy nutritious uh, a meal for households who have someone in hospice care, for example. There are a lot of other options, but these are the six that kind of floated to the top that people are excited to start right away if we're able to make this kitchen happen. And so these are some conceptual drawings we've gotten uh, with our architectural partner, the Collaborative out of Toledo. And some highlights here is, um, first of all, uh, in conversations with, with, the, with the judges, uh, there is, um, some desire to have secured parking for the judges. And so as part of this project, we, we are talking with the architects and the judges about how we might offer that secure parking as part of this project for our judges. And then you can see um, there's the, the addition comes on the back of the historical building and you can kind of denote the difference because instead of the curved windows, it has a more modern window feel. And so it'd be tearing down the 1950s addition to the church and expanding out into the parking lot, uh, part of the parking lot and a new addition. Here you can see how the architectural elements are sort of being carried through. There's a pattern in the historical building of two windows, three windows, two windows, three windows. And so that theme of two and three is carried forward. There's an, there's an entrance to the community kitchen off of Jefferson Street we're envisioning that would, where people would come in that allows people to enter that space and leave that space without having to uh, in any way uh, step foot onto our religious property. And so in some ways this community kitchen um, is a duplex kind of model. It shares a wall with the church, but it's its own separate space. Um, and so an interior view of, of the concept of what it could look like is you see that entrance into Jeffer off of Jefferson Street here, the uh, two, full two-story front of the church with those big windows looking out onto National Corner. And then under the, the uh, second floor uh, administrative area would be the functional working kitchen. And this front part could be flexible. It might have cafeteria seating like you see now, or it might have additional workstations for when we're teaching cooking classes. The administrative area above is intentionally designed so that you cannot enter it uh, because primarily it'd be a space for church administration, although we would share it with um, other groups who we're collaborating with on the community kitchen or other projects. Um, but we intentionally make it so that you can't enter that space 
from the community kitchen. To enter our administrative area, you'd have to enter off that, uh, a stairway between the, um, the annex um, and the church or come in through our worship space to go there. So it, it's re maintained separate. So as you can see, uh, this space is it's really designed to be something that is a community asset. And this is a view of what it would look like um, potentially from that landing coming in off of Jefferson Street. So I think that's a short presentation. Uh, we are very excited to explore this opportunity uh, with, with you and, and talk about how this might fit into um, your vision of, of the courthouse square and of course um, the community, the county in, in general. Thank you. And if I can add uh, just a, a few comments to pick up on a point that uh, Father Aaron mentioned, um, during the last year as we've developed these ideas and plans, we have um, uh, been in contact with the judges, um, the uh, clerk of courts in the Justice Center, and the sheriff at several meetings to get their input and, um, and also to um, ask any concerns, issues that they might have. And I think the end result of that is that we have uh, their solid support. Um, um, one of the, the ideas that came of those discussions is that working with the pivot program that the court offers, that uh, this could be a resource, a kitchen that could be used for programming to help people in the pivot program to make um, positive, healthy decisions um, as they uh, try to, to be successful in the program. So um, we, we, I want to let you know that we have reached out to the judges and that uh, they have uh, supported the, the project. We also, with those conversations, um, gathered information about the, the remaining parking lot that would still be a part of and owned by the county. And um, that's from those discussions, we learned of the security uh, requirements that uh, they would like to add to that, that uh, area. And um, we are committed to include that as a part of the, the project um, at no cost uh, to uh, the, the county. So thank you both for your presentation, Reverend or Father Aaron, appreciate it, uh, Brent. Now, from a practical standpoint, what specifically are we asking the county to do? Uh, are we asking them to donate the uh, space to the church? Are we asking them for a long-term lease? Uh, what, what specifically, what kind of action are you looking for us to take, Brent? Yeah, specifically, we would like the, the commissioners to um, agree to transfer this 20 by, 25 by 55 foot strip of property to the church. So it would be an actual transfer of property. And that we would um, go through whatever required process that you have for the, uh, the, the transfer of property. And there I know are statutory requirements when you um, uh, agree to transfer property. Um, we would, the, the city or the, the church would pay for um, all of the cost of surveying that are required all cost of uh, the transfer, uh, recording fees, um, publication fees that might be necessary in the newspaper. So this would be at no cost uh, to the county. Have you had any conversation with uh, uh, Derek Devine regarding the procedure? I have, yes. I, I've talked to Derek. Um, we've talked about uh, the need to go through uh, publication um, of your interest in selling the property, a notice, and then eventually um, at the end of that would be um, a, um, a bids for the property. And we believe that um, um, you know, we can offer based on especially the, the improvements that probably are going to be tens of thousands of dollars to cr uh, build a secured parking area, that that would um, uh, be adequate consideration for uh, um, for um, the transfer of the property. Um, so I have talked to Derek and we've begun that, uh, that conversation. Specifically, I think that in the, um, and I don't know, I'm not expecting it in your meeting today, but at maybe your next meeting next week, if we're ready, that you would approve the, the sale process. 
And then at the end of that process, after the required notice and receiving any bids for this property, reserving your right to reject any and all, all bids, like you would do in all cases, we would, um, you would have a, a separate approval at that time for the actual transfer. But you start the process, I believe, with approving um, the notice and to begin the process. Well, first of all, Brian, what is the what, what is the uh, fundraising uh, timeline on this and construction timeline once it started? Yeah, good question. Um, um, our expected fundraising timeline is approximately one year. Um, from when we get started here, uh, we know that we have the property. Uh, we have begun some preliminary plans with that. We've identified some um, larger resources through our diocese and otherwise that uh, we could uh, have a jump start in our fundraising process. But we think it's about a one year time frame. Once uh, that is secured, then it's uh, approximately a, a one year um, construction. So we're hopeful. Uh, right now, it's a tentative two-year project. So if the project didn't go forward, um, could there be a provision in there that it reverted back to the county? We could. We could do uh, a reversionary clause in the, um, in the uh, deed. Okay. Well, uh, again, first of all, uh, Father and Brent, I think you guys have got a wonderful vision here. Uh, I appreciate the... Uh, thought process. I appreciate the enhancement to downtown. And uh, I know that you've done your uh, due diligence with the judges and with the clerk. And uh, I think that everything is, is set to go. Uh, I know that we have received as commissioners a, a similar presentation that Father gave us today and have had, um, uh, you know, has significant time to review that and consider it. So thank you very much. Uh, I, gentlemen, uh, other commissioners, what's your pleasure? How would you like to move forward? Yeah, I would like to refer this to Derek Devine for positive consideration. Uh, you know, I would like a reversion clause in it, uh, but I would like to give some, you know, we can take formal action uh, at some future date, but, uh, you know, not to delay folks. Uh, I'm, I'm ready to, to accept this. Okay. Yeah, those are my feelings as well, uh, Commissioner. Let's uh, begin the process with Derek. And uh, I'd like the revisionary clause too, Shane. I think that's appropriate. And um, yeah, let's move forward. So by moving forward, are we asking Der Derek to uh, put together the um, uh, necessary documentation to start the bidding process? He can take care of that. Yeah, I think that's, we'll, you, we'll defer to him, but um, after listening to Brent, that's what appears the next step to be. Um, and then uh, at some point we'd have to take formal action on that, maybe next meeting, but let's, let's let Derek get back to us with what we need to do. That's how okay. I'm kind of thinking how it works. All right, Father and Brent, thank you very much for the presentation. Any additional comments? Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And uh, I will also uh, work with Derek on it uh, and answer any questions that he may have. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you very Thanks, much. Sir. Okay. Uh, we are next on the agenda, the County Administrator's Report. Uh, the only thing I got today is the uh, Coronavirus Relief Fund request. I'm find that quick. Um, too many screens open at one time. Um, going to share uh, pretty beach. Okay, these are the requests that uh, the uh, coronavirus relief fund uh, committee uh, reviewed yesterday and um, deem them allowable uh, and are presented for your um, approval. Um, the health department has asked for an additional, actually a new freezer and a new refrigerator, um, both necessary for 
you know, the vaccines that, uh, you know, are hopefully going to be soon. Um, so she's got those requests in. We got additional masks, hand sanitizer, some of the th same things you've already approved. Um, you know, additional uh, uh, barrier, permanent barrier for the recorder's office, um, kind of like the auditor's office did, you know, the clerk's office. They put the plexiglass protection, a more permanent uh, position. Uh, I think the treasurer's working on uh, one as well. So as you can see, the request for this week would be $25,490.93, which takes it up to a total of uh, $477 that we will have uh, allocated so far. Uh, just remember, we still have the uh, grant that's outstanding. Um, I sent an email to Charlie this morning to see if she's heard anything more on that grant. Um, but this is what I have to present for you today. If you have any questions. Motion to accept. I'll second. Okay. Uh, additional discussion? Hearing none. Nikki, a roll call, please. Commissioner Thomas. Yes. Commissioner Paradiso. Yes. Commissioner Kirshner. Yes. Uh, Stacy, anything else from you? Nope, that's all I had today. Okay, Commissioner reports, uh, starting with uh, Commissioner Thomas. I just wanted to say congratulations to all the winners of Downtown Awards last night at the Downtown Summit. It was held virtually, and uh, a lot of great awards handed out, a lot of uh, thriving businesses and entrepreneurs. Uh, and we had some statewide awards as well. Uh, Count, uh, Mr. Cownow and National Corner and uh, Sabrina Schneppet at Winterberry Farms. So my hat's off to all of them. Uh, and as well as the, the new award, which is the director's award, went to the members of Tiffin Tomorrow. Um, many of them we know, uh, Representative Ryan Key and Mitch Felton and Dale DePew and Ann Gase. So uh, hats off to them. Keep up the good work. That's all I got. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Paradiso. Yes, I think uh, a lot of exciting things are happening. Uh, I echo Shane's comments. Uh, hats off to the chamber. Uh, Bryce Riggs set the ground running July 1st. Uh, record number of new members, even through COVID. Uh, this project we heard about uh, earlier uh, with the community kitchen. These are just great examples of things that are going on in our, our community. So uh, we appreciate uh, everything that people do to make this this community better. Um, I would like to uh, just make a comment on my position on the museum. Uh, Commissioner Thomas had his uh, uh, Zoom meeting on Tuesday. I have my thoughts together um, and I would like to uh, put that on the agenda for next Wednesday or next Thursday to talk about and I will be uh, circulating those comments out before that meeting and uh, so we can you know have that discussion uh, and i've uh, been working a little bit uh, behind the scenes with uh, ems talking to different people meeting with uh, uh, several people and uh, just want the community and the public to know that that's uh, we're working on that so um, There'll be more formal action, I'm sure, uh, you know, to come. But uh, that concludes my report. And we do have Stacy Wilson scheduled our strategic planning meeting, October. What's the date? Uh, Nikki, I think it's the 14th. 14th. So. Yeah, the 14th. Uh, I'm sure that part of the uh, discussions will be uh, as part of that conversation uh, for the future. Uh, both the EMS and the museum. So we'll have, uh, we'll have those discussions as we update our strategic plan and look at where we're at with our proposed action plan from last year. Okay, moving to old business, airport change order number one. Uh, yes, let's see, I don't know if I have that one up on my screen. I have it in writing. Um, we've had a few updates, uh, I think uh, Commissioner Paradiso had updated us a while ago about the um, issues 
with the taxiway pavement project. Um, we've had uh, conversations during session with Brian Crozier from Stantec, and um, we, we seen the estimate a few weeks ago. They finally got the change order ready to submit. Um, I think Brian is on uh, to answer any questions, um, but the change order is in the amount of $253,227.25. Uh, the additional contract was uh, $345,797.57. So that would bring the total to 599, 0.24.82. Uh, uh, so if you have any questions that I can't answer, Brian is on the call. Remind us how we're going to pay for that. Brian? <laughs> uh, per the discussion last time, um, you, you guys will have to cover that for the time being, but the FAA is talking about coming back and reimbursing you as part of an FY21 grant for that. It may potentially take FY22 as well, um, but in a recent conversation with Alex at the FAA, uh, he did let me know that they're going to do everything they can to try and get this taken care of as quickly as possible. That may uh, include that if somebody else has non-primary entitlement money next year that they're carrying over, that they would be able to transfer that money to you and you could potentially get it all reimbursed next year as opposed to waiting over the next two years to get reimbursed for the dollar amount. So can't you can't guarantee anything on that, obviously, but that that's the the intent is for them to try and get you reimbursed as quickly as possible primary money because that's the only money they can use for uh, the reimbursements um, for something that was done previously, which is this will end up being done previously on future grants. So, so uh, Brian, uh, Tony, Tony speaking, just so I'm clear, um, the, the county will be reimbursed, I think, Summarize yes. everything you said is will we be reimbursed in one year or over two years? That's really yes. the question. So I want everyone to know um, that we will have to front the money out of the general fund uh, to pay this. We do expect 150,000 of this to come back as early as uh, before the end of this year. Is that possible? Um. That I'm not sure. We'll have to talk to Alex about that. I know you'll have your planning call coming up here soon on how quick they can e uh, issue that. But as you're aware, they also want us to proceed with that drainage project as part of the 2021 grant. Yes. There's a possibility that they may wait and issue that all as one grant, which would not be able to be done by the end of this year. It would probably be middle next year before they could get that issued. Okay, and then uh, the balance then would just be the following year. And the year, the FAA year begins October 1st, right? Yes, yes. And that, and that would potentially be able to be, if you had no other grants in that following year, there would be no reason as soon as Congress had appropriated money and they were authorized to issue grants, they could potentially issue one if, like, as soon as the fiscal year starts or, you know, within a few months. Um, it would just depend, it, that really is dependent on what's going on in Washington at the time. So, okay. So, Brian, uh, Mike Kirshner here. Um, we have an airport improvement plan, as you're aware. Uh, the money that will come back to us from the FAA uh, will be used to complete this project. Does that mean that other plans that we might have would have to be deferred in the future years because? The money's not going to be used for part of that plan, but for this project. So your current plan shows your next couple projects is a couple little land acquisitions that are still needed to clear up your airspace. Um, those would be essentially pushed back however many years it takes to get the reimbursement done. Um, the drainage project that the FA has asked us to do to also help so that we don't run into a repeat of this issue. Um, they're going to fund that, they said next year, out of apportionment or discretionary funds. That will not delay your projects at all. So if that ends up being a significant project 
and I'm fairly certain that it will end up being, you know, somewhere from a quarter to half a million dollars for that project. Um, that will not push back your uh, any of your other projects. That'll come out of different uh, competitive funding sources that the FAA has. So, and then as far as your other projects being pushed back one or two years, that would be dependent upon whether they can pull somebody else's non-primary money for you next year so they can get you all reimbursed next year. If they do that, then it would only bump your schedule back one year. Okay, thank you. Thank you, any additional comments? Do we have all this in writing? Um, I would, I've probably, written some i'll have to go back and check i think i've summarized the phone calls we've had with alex back to him in writing um i'll, I'll verify that though to make sure it's all in writing but uh we do have alex has already in several email exchanges has approved the change order and he is all on board with all that um so i do have stuff like that in writing um the reimbursement it, it, you know, I'll make sure we have it in writing, but if they said they were going to do that, they'll do it. Um, but we'll make sure we get that in writing. We had him on a, on a Zoom call where he, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, basically agreed to everything we're discussing. Right, Brian? Yes. Alex. Okay. 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 Any additional discussion regarding the airport? Nope, I would just have a resolution authorizing the change order if uh, that's how you'd like to proceed. You have that resolution prepared at this yep. point? Yep. Okay. Uh, can you put that up for us? Or you, uh, just we... authorizing the contract change order for the taxiway pavement rehab at the Seneca County Airport uh, and includes in the resolution the details I read earlier with the amounts and the changes that are needed for the change order. Okay, can I get a motion to that effect? I'll make a motion. We uh, accept or accept that resolution as read. Okay. And they, do I have a second? Okay, I will second second the motion with the provision that um, we do indeed have an audit trail, if you will, of, of conversations. Uh, that verifies in writing or by recorded conversations that this is uh, the intention of the FAA. Is that acceptable, Tony? Yes. Okay. You're seconding the motion, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, Nikki, roll call, please. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Paradiso? Yes. Commissioner Kirshner? Yes. Okay. Uh, I guess we're at the supplemental appropriations, uh, Stacy. Yes. And uh, I only have one since you've approved the uh, change order. Uh, I have a supplemental appropriation uh, for the uh, airport's contract service line. Uh, in the amount of $253,227.25. Um, the other resolution I have, I have that on my screen. Um, it's the uh, contract with, let me find it. Uh, authorizing a contract service agreement with NCOESC to provide all necessary and appropriate staff and instructions for the Seneca County Youth Center. Uh, this was tabled last week um, with some questions that uh, we've followed up with uh, juvenile probate court and the judges here, I think as well as some of his staff is here as well um, to answer some of those questions. Okay. So, you know, my questions were uh, centered around, you know, what the value of that is and, uh, Judge Meyer got me some information on that, so I, I appreciate that. And you know, this is one of those uh, interesting situations where we're authorizing a contract to spend other people's money. Uh, so it's really school district money and it's got a value of a quarter of a million dollars. So, you know, I think it, it, it merits uh, 
a little slower consideration as it comes across our desk. And uh, that, you know, that's kind of one of our sacred uh, missions as commissioners. We, pre we pre approve these contracts. So um, I appreciate the information that Judge Meyer got me. I'm satisfied. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure that, uh, absolutely sure that the staff at uh, North Central does an excellent job for him. But, uh, you know, we always have to be careful with taxpayer money, especially taxpayer money that we don't have direct control over. But uh, in this case, by authorizing this contract, we are uh, essentially authorizing North Central to spend other school districts money. And so, um, you know, we need to be mindful of that. And, you know, I would love to see, a, you know, a process to award this contract. But, uh, you know, if judge is satisfied with the service he's getting, I I'm, I'm more than satisfied. Is that a motion? Would that be a motion, Shane? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll motion to approve it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll second. Thank okay. you. Comments. Any additional discussion? Hearing none, Nikki, roll call, please. Commissioner Thomas? Yes. Commissioner Paradiso? Yes. Commissioner Kirshner? Yes. Uh, we are going to go into executive session to talk about pending litigation. Uh, but before that, I will ask if the commissioners or Stacy has anything additional to be brought before the board today. I don't know. Okay, if not, uh, Jimmy, it's time to open it up to uh, public comment. Sure, so if you'd like to comment and you're on the phone line, you can hit star six to unmute your line. If not, go ahead and hit that unmute button and come forward now. I just wanna see how quick Audrey is. I guess commissioners, uh, this is uh, Judge Meyer. Before I, I sign off, I wanna thank you guys for your support. Um, Thank you guys for the uh, funding to get my staff back here full time. Certainly uh, we are knee deep in it, but we are crawling our way out of our, our docket here and really appreciate the support Again, appreciate the uh, support as far as us running the youth center and all the things that we get to do. So again, uh, I don't get a chance to talk to you as much as I'd like uh, due to COVID, but again, appreciate the work that you're doing and the support that you provide for the court. So those are my comments today. Have a great day guys. Thank you, Judge. Okay, well, as always, uh, Mike Ditto from Highbridge is on the uh, on the line. I see, I wondered if he had any updates for us regarding CARES money or uh, any other issues. Uh, thanks, Commissioner, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, so the legislature is out of session for the most part uh, for right now. Uh, we know about the, the CARES distribution that came uh, recently uh, through OBM and they, we had a different per capita formula. So that's still kind of on its way if it hasn't already arrived. Federal government is still haggling over some other appropriations bills and things like that in Congress. I suspect still that most of that will be handled in the lame duck session to hopefully uh, give us all some clarity and some uh, ability to be more flexible on how those COVID uh, CARES dollars are being spent. And we are also having conversations uh, here in Columbus with legislators as we can uh, regarding the potential capital budget, uh, which we are still hopeful for in the lame duck session. Uh, so here on October 1st, it's uh, a little light right now. The only thing that's really happening at the State House, at least this week, uh, has been the select committee created by Ohio House Speaker Bob Cup uh, regarding the potential repeal and replacement of House Bill 6. Uh, so that has sort of dominated the news here in Columbus uh, with the election pending in uh, just a little over, uh, or a little under five weeks now. Uh, I ex expect a very, very robust lame duck session when we come back from the election. Are any of our reps on that uh, select committee? I don't believe they are. Um, uh, Representative Reineke uh, is not, uh, and, and Senator Burke, obviously, since he is in the Senate, is not. It is about 15 House members, give or take. Uh, there are folks that are for the legislation when it passed out of the House and others that are against it. And by and large, they've been hearing um, pretty substantial testimony uh, over the last few weeks uh, about the potential to repeal and replace the legislation. Uh, the chairman of the committee, Jim Hoops, uh, from uh, Napoleon, not too far from you, uh, announced yesterday that he expects some action, but not until after the election. So I think they will continue hearing testimony on that, but uh, they have not done anything at this point other than hear testimony. Okay, 
Very good. Thank you, Mike. Always, always very informative. I appreciate it. You bet. Uh, Jimmy, anyone else out there? Uh, I'm not sure if David, Zach, or Audrey were going to talk, maybe? Both, good. actually, with your permission. Good, uh, good morning. It's good to be here. Um, super excited about everything going down uh, downtown. I think the, uh, the project that um, Aaron Gerlach and, and Brent and many others have been working on is extremely exciting for our community. So I, I appreciate that very much, Father Aaron and everyone else involved. Um, wanted to update you quickly on the, the CARES Act uh, grant program that we have running for the city, just kind of where that's at, because there are a lot of people that listen to that. So businesses inside and then Audrey will have a note about how we're looking to expand that to the, the townships and villages as well. But the program's been, the application period is open until uh, five o'clock on October the 12th. It opened yesterday at noon. We have 16 applications that have been submitted and 16 that are in the process of being put together. Uh, these are grants up to $6,000 for businesses, two to 30 employees and for less than two employees uh, up to 3K. And so we're excited about that. Um, and it seems to be going very well. Um, we have on our site at tiffincares.com, we have a tutorial on how to apply. So we kind of walk people through the process. We have one of our recorded informational sessions. So if anybody is hearing about it for the first time and you're located in the corporate limits of the city of Tiffin, please go and apply. And with that, I'd like to turn the talking stick over to Audrey to talk about our plans for making it available to some of the villages and townships that have indicated they're interested in doing that, uh, that we got from a survey that Charlene had put out. So uh, Audrey, you want to touch on that? Yeah, thanks, David. Thanks, commissioners. Um, uh, yeah, so we are working together, uh, David and I and Charlene, to try to put together a plan for uh, us to be able to make this resource available to the rural businesses through uh, the townships, the villages, um, the county, whoever decides they're interested. We just want to make sure that we're ready to, to provide the resource. Um, so we are going to host a couple of information sessions about this opportunity and how it might look, what it, how it might work. Um, there'll be one next Wednesday the 7th and one on Wednesday the 14th. Um, and then we're also going to be, you know, available for anyone to reach out about how this will look and, and um, you know, how they can get involved and whether they can use the resource or not. Um, but really, I, I just really wanted to make sure that we, you know, provided something for the rural businesses since we're able to do this for the businesses in the city. Um, we, I really want to make sure that there's um, at least an opportunity for the rural businesses, hopefully, to be able to access some, you know, some funds for resources. So um, I guess, you know, like I said, we're just, we're, we're putting it together, we're working on it, and we're going to make it available to whoever wants it. And between David and I and Charlene, we're going to make sure that we get it up and running pretty quickly. So um, David, did I miss anything? Or do you all have any questions about that, commissioners? Well, let me, uh, let me ask a question here. Obviously, the city of Tiffin has established the CARES uh, loan program or grant program, I should say, out of money that they received from the CARES Act the money that would be distributed or would be granted to rural communities or villages or townships, that money is coming from where? And that's coming from their CARES allocation uh, that I believe, I don't know the logistics of it, Stacy. if it's, it kind of comes through the county to them if they request it, but it's, it's money. Stacy. do you have comments on whether that's specifically allocated to them? I know Charlene's been working on trying to help them spend yeah. it. Each of them had the opportunity to submit their resolution to get their allocation, and I think everyone on Charlene's list has received uh, their both their allocation first and second. And I'm guessing since they have some mon money available, they're interested in this program. So, so let me let me be clear: if a township had just to use a number ten thousand dollars that could be designated for them, and they're only going to use five they could take that pool of $5,000 and make it available to personal businesses or to private businesses for assistance during this time. Is that right? Yes. So do we have any idea? I mean, the city announced how much money? 600,000. 600,000. Mm -hmm. Do we have any idea, Stacy Wilson, as to what type of a pool of money that could possibly be for townships and villages? Uh, I do not. Okay. And then, um, so, um, David, so the 600000 is that leftover money from the city? Where's that? That's that city CARES money. Okay. So, so that's city now we're talking care. about a, a second fund for townships and villages of leftover money? 
Yeah. So fundamentally, this it's it's yeah, it's it's the city's money. We're a subrecipient of the grant. We administer those funds on their behalf. Six hundred. The six hundred, and so it would be the same thing. So we would have a grant agreement with each entity that wanted us to administer those funds for that purpose. And then uh, Commissioner Thomas brought up way back uh, a con a similar concept. She, you may want to comment where the county with its leftover funds, if any. Uh, we would have the opportunity to do something similar. I'm not sure uh, we've got there, but it's, you know, Shane brought it up way back that we would consider this. So there's basically three buckets of money of leftover money not used, right, at the city, township, villages, county that can be used to go back to support businesses that were affected. Is that, is there three buckets of money? Am I missing something? So, I mean, just to clarify, each, every, you know, local jurisdiction all had their own bucket of CARES money that was allocated to them. The city had a bucket, you as a county had a bucket, each township and village has a bucket. And then they can choose to use that for various different things. You know, everyone made sure they could fund everything, you know, coronavirus related, supply related. If there's things they could fund for their, you know, fire EMS, they, you know, fund that. Everybody kind of is trying to take care of their own needs first, um, obviously. And then yes, whatever portion of that, that they feel, you know, they have everything covered that they can and they want to provide um, each jurisdiction can provide that for um, things inside their own just jurisdiction. So we are providing a way for if each jurisdiction that chooses to do this, we're providing a way that they can use those funds to get it out to businesses. Yeah. So there That's are there are there are twenty four buckets. It's each of the townships has a bucket. So each the of the municipalities, yeah, the municipalities have a bucket, yeah. and the county has a bucket. The money initially, if I remember correctly, came as a lump sum to the county and we dispersed it uh, as a percentage of population. I'm not sure what the equation was or as a- uh, the, the, first, the first two deposits were to the county, obviously, because it goes through the auditor, but then was distributed to the entities via the local government funding formula. The third one that should be coming will be that different formula by population. So, right. So, local government formula were the first two, and by population is the third one. But each of each time there is a disbursement of those funds, it comes to the county, and the county then distributes it according to that formula to each of the other political subdivisions. Is that correct? Yes, as long as they have issued the resolution uh, to the auditor. Okay. It's not at the discretion of the county what that money, how much they get, it's required to follow the local government funding formula. So that's why we're trying to put the emphasis to the townships and the villages to apply for what they have coming. So if they do have excess, they could use it for private industry. Because there has been, there have been some situations in which a township or a village hasn't made an application for anything. Is that also correct? Yes, there's a few that have not submitted any resolutions and do not anticipate submitting resolution. But if they did submit a resolution for their share, they wouldn't necessarily have to use it for their own reimbursement. They could use it for the private sector in their townships. So again, you know, it would be prudent uh, if everyone would apply for those funds. Yeah. That's what the money was intended for, but my understand, my thought was that unused money would revert back to the county or would be pooled at the township village level, but since TSEP is stepping up and will help facilitate, then I can see how there could be 24, whatever the number is, David, different. Well, I'm sure that Audrey could work with the trustees in each of the townships to yeah, determine as you know. I, I like that. That's more local. And, and I agree with you, Mike. We should just encourage them to take advantage of that. And, and the county can do that if you so choose. Um, but if we're going to do that, we need to do that soon. I know I had talked to David uh, just a week ago, and it, it's not a quick process. So, you know, if we yeah. were interested in having them do that, you know, 
Yeah, we know that the commissioners are thinking about a lot of things related to this, including other grants and other funding streams. What we're, what we're intending to do is to try to make it available to set the system up so that anybody that would want to participate up, we're, we're going to come up with that hard deadline date by which so everybody knows we have to pass the resolution by the state to get it done. Um, so again, we're, we're just putting something out there that if it makes sense for people and they want to do it, that's possible. So um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at. We should have that by the weekend. We'll know exactly what those dates are. At least that's our intention. Get that to the commissioners, get that to the townships, get that to the villages, so everybody's, and again, that's, that's our plan. Yeah, and again, to repeat uh, Commissioner Paradiso's remarks, Commissioner Thomas did indeed suggest this three or four or five months ago, um, and maybe we ought to formalize any excess funds we have and, and quantify uh, how much that amount is, as the city has done, to determine whether or not uh, people can apply to that pool. I don't think it's a matter of excess. Um, you know, if that uh, court grant does not go through, we have projects to use that money. If that goes through, then we will have some available. But if you choose, um, you can choose any amount and allocate it now. It doesn't have to necessarily be excess that we haven't spent. Does that make sense? It just, yeah, it it's just a portion. Sense. If you guys decide to do it, then we'll do it. And we just know we can't spend that on other projects. Well, as a contingency to the court grant money, um, you know, I think that I think that we could come up with a motion that um, would exclude that. I think in the event that we do receive that, then this is what we would do. In the event that we don't receive that, then we would do X. So uh, we ought to maybe come up with some resolution for next week so that we can then have uh, economic development folks uh, handle the program for us. That would be great. Okay. Uh, any uh, David, do you know if Fostoria is doing anything at this point? Uh, I think Renee's on the line and my understanding, so I don't want to speak for Renee. Is she still on the line or I thought I saw her. Uh, my understanding was she was putting something together. Okay. Uh, Cause I gave her all my stuff. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, I was at the FEDC board meeting, I, uh, Commissioner Paradiso was as well, and they're working on it. So afterwards, I was like, Renee, here, don't reinvent the wheel. This is all this is all the stuff I got from the other folks. So we tried to be good partners and, and provide them with what we had at the time. That was okay. a couple Shane, weeks. Are you, uh, uh, are you comfortable with going down this direction with the extra? If any, I, I hear you, Stace, but so we at least have a plan because there are deadlines. Uh, yeah, you know, we're always in that strange situation where we cover Faustoria, Tiffin, and the outlying areas. So making those funds available, um, you know, across that, you know, I'm just trying to think through if it makes sense for us to contribute to uh, three different programs and that be our contribution, you know, Faustoria, City of Tiffin, and the outlying areas, or if we run our own program and eliminate duplicates that that's always the trick at the county level oh, so i think stacy can come up with a number that she's yeah. she's comfortable with and present it to us and i i would be happy to to support that yeah i mean i the idea of having it um uh, specific to the townships and the villages only because of the um uh, inability of them to be as sophisticated as the cities uh, because they have bigger staffs, obviously. That, well, my... you know, David, they've set up the template and um, yeah, so that's a good point. Let's uh, have that discussion. Uh, be ready, David. We may be uh, adding more. What's yeah, we're, we're, we're getting ready for that because we're, we're, you know, we're anticipating having a, a program called Seneca Cares where somebody would indicate what jurisdiction they're in. And so depending on what money comes in, we can tailor it to accommodate whatever ends up happening. So that's, that's the way we're going. And if the county wanted to then our funds go towards these, it would work. But we're not going to have 15 different programs with 15 different applications. It's, we had Tiffin Cares, we're going to have Seneca Cares. And if a business goes on there, they're just going to indicate where they're at. And then, you know, for all the eligible jurisdictions. And if it's the countywide and there's additional money for folks that aren't in, this is one of the things that we said is if there are townships that don't want to take advantage of it for whatever reason, 
uh, to have some county funds that could support those. I know Audrey's been talking to me about this for weeks because uh, we, she's she's there for the road. She wants to make sure everybody gets covered. Uh, we can make sure that they get some of those funds as well if they can't access it through one of the participating villages or townships. Yeah, if I may, that's um, my the goal ultimately would be that a business in the county, no matter where they happen to be situated uh, physically or ge geographically, would have access uh, to something. So certain townships and certain villages are going to take advantage of this. Um, you know, ideally, any business anywhere would be able to access some funds, um, depending on who all chooses to participate. Um, I hope that we're able to, you know, that we don't have to exclude certain businesses where they're at, but um, we're happy to work with whoever wants to participate. Very good. Thank you very much for your input here today. Uh, any additional comments out there, Jimmy? I'm seeing none at this time, but just a reminder, if you're joining us on the phone line to hit star six to unmute your line. If not, you can hit the unmute button here on the computer or your, or your mobile device and come forward now with your public comments. Good morning, everyone. I just wanted to give you a super brief update. This is Isabel over at Regional Planning. Um, I know it's kind of crazy because we were just finishing up round 34 for OPWC issue one, and we are now in, they're changing the name to fiscal year 22 is what we will be in this next round. So um, we have a meeting with the uh, engineer next week to look over the application. We had all 15 townships uh, participating and so well we'll keep you in the loop um, as far as that goes. So that was all. Thank you Isabel. Anyone else? We do have uh, the need for an executive session. I would accept the motion to go to an executive session regarding as it relates to pending litigation, I believe is the, uh, the reason. Yeah, I'll make that motion. I'd like to add personnel. We have one little issue I want to discuss. Um, sure. So yeah, motion to go into executive session to discuss pending litigation and personnel. I will. I will second. Okay. Uh, we do not expect any action to come out of the executive session. So we will leave this meeting uh, up uh, while we go into executive session and come back and finish it. But uh, I wouldn't expect any, any other action other than for us to simply adjourn. So having said that, we will uh, pause this uh, video and uh, we will meet in executive session. Uh, I, I guess I should have done roll call, but uh, I think we're okay. Uh, we'll go forward, thanks.
folks. Okay. I think the catchphrase of 2020 is please take yourself off mute. Uh, it is 1113, according to my clock here. Uh, we are out of executive session, and I will accept a motion for adjournment. So moved. So moved. Second. Uh, we are effectively adjourned 1113. Thank you all. Be safe.